Uh, welcome back to the VTU e Shikshana program. Today we are concluding on module 2 where we are basically talking about storm water drainage. The drainage which comes out of basements, paved areas, podiums, rainwater harvesting, the rooftop harvesting and the drainage which actually comes out of its landscapes and how exactly we can reduce the load on the municipal system. So, this is where we are concluding on the module 2, where um, the module 2 basically has both uh, sewerage system and storm water. So, this is the final part of the module 2. Drainage is basically classified into three different types. One is foul drainage, surface drainage and combined drainage. Modern properties which tend to have two separate drainage systems installed are called as the foul water system collection, which basically collects all the foul water from the kitchen and the bathroom. Now, this water is processed at the local effluent treatment plants, while the surface water system collects all the water from the roof and the paving and discharges it to as a clean water into a local water course. And this clean water is discharged into a ditch, stream or river to reduce all the demand on the effluent treatment plant. So, basically if you notice this is a damp proof concreting, you have your gully trap. So, this gully trap basically would connect all the valleys of your roofs and your structure and from there it would collect it into the um, pipeline. This, that would be the summit of the roof and the, there would be valleys and all of these are collecting all of this at the uh, source itself. So, this is where you have your foul uh, water system collection because basically all your kitchen as well as your bathroom waste comes and gets collected at this particular point and from there it lends itself into the journey to the first channel that is the linear channel. The drainage of the open ground is not always practical as you all know for many reasons. The ground is not sufficiently free draining and sending water off the edge of the pavement would simply end up creating loads of muddy puddles or the ground may be carefully nurtured garden or a lawn that would suffer if subjected to excessive water or there might be any gr open ground which is not there and all the open ground which is available is a small patch and it is totally impractical to indulge it, it with water. As a very half, uh, rough rule of thumb, we do not like to drain an area of more than 1.5 meters width into the immediately adjacent open ground. So, this is basic common uh, terms when it comes to free draining. So, free draining happens only within a spacing of 1.5 meters from an immediately adjacent open ground and it is not practical because it also carries a lot of muddy puddles, it also carries anything that comes out of your gardens and lawns and also might suffer because there is a lot of excessive water which would come out and it would uh, build up the traffic in the drain. Draining more than 1.5 meters of the hard paving onto the open ground or a garden usually results in a lot of water logging or flooding, albeit it could be temporary. But while a 3 meter wide pavement on the right could be drained on either side, as shown the draining of the whole path just to one side is probably asking for trouble. So, if you have a drain and if you have lawns on either side and the or pavements on either side with drains following them. So, this basically would not cause any kind of water flooding or water logging. So, the, you have to always keep in mind that at least a 3 meter wide pavement should be provided on either side. So, we do not have any kind of trouble in draining out all the water. The arrows that you see here are denoting all the falls in the pavement to drain all the gullies, the garden and the linear channels in the threshold with the public highway. So, these are the gullies and this is the drain fall. So, all these gullies are collecting all the water from the roof and they are basically trying to transform it into the linear channels. So, along with the linear channels, we also have other uh, surface 
um, let offs which are basically going to be coming and joining along with your traps to the main system or the lateral sewers. Here if you notice there is a 100 millimeter strip of flagstone which is used to move the shallow footing against the linear channel. It, it is basically directed to stay away from any kind of masonry wall. So, this stone strip is laid in a slope away from the channel, away from the conservatory while the remaining of the patio slopes towards the building. So, this is done so that any water that is to be drained gets drained before it touches the uh, building surface. And this channel which you see at the threshold of the garage is basically to backfall any kind of water that would fall come into the driveway. Within a paving, if you have to create any kind of channel, you need to think about what kind of channel system are you trying to work on. You can always think of a creating a V shaped channel because a V shaped channel is very easy because you can distance it out from the masonry also and also consider some kind of loss with respect to its slope and uh, other end fall which could come up. So, this soldier course, this is called as a soldier course because you are paving it in a V shape also trying to see if there are wedges so that the water gets percolated into the ground and then that is the surface level upon which the sand is, uh, this is the sand layer which is basically laid right below the brick layer. This, this is called as a soldier course which is laid at at least 20 mm of rainfall away from the masonry. So, that the actual lowest point of pavement is 200 mm below the uh, away from the uh, you know brickwork. With all the flags and slabs shown the V channel might be at least of a 300 mm uh, um, width say at least a backfall of 300 mm is provided. So, if this is a threshold that you see and that is a brick masonry, you would have a linear channel all along and any outfall would soak away all the water right from the public highways to the insides of the buildings. These are certain examples of linear channels which are provided at driveways. These are provided basically at thresholds though set a, a little aback from the boundaries. So, if these are the boundaries, you, you also notice that this threshold enters, would have an intercepted drain at even if a new development is supposed to happen. So, if any new development is constructed, you can always make sure that an intercepted drain is provided. So, that we do not have uh, to actually burden only the existing sewer line. And various types of pavings can be done. The various types of pavings as discussed can be regarded with respect to the inlets as well as the purposes which could be relative to the impermeable uh, you know materials that is which does not drain the water through it, but collects it on the surface and therefore all such pavements should be designed to drain a disposal point such as a gully. So, that is a gully that you see here. And this gully is a linear drain or some other kind of an outfall like a ditch or a soakway or a rain garden. The notable expectation that you see here is you can actually plant a lot of uh, you know uh, uh, grass or plants here and a linear channel will collect all the surface water from it by disposing it as a soakway and a gully is uh, is like one method in which all the drainage fittings are all combined together and they all come and meet at one particular point. Failure to actually drain any pavement can cause a lot of problems for us with respect to the water density. So, water on the surface encourages mosses, it encourages algae and other kind of vegetation to colonize the paving. In any kind of wet conditions and even shallow puddles can become dangerous. So, and over a long period this standing water can actually damage the whole paving itself. And this is also another wrong method in which we can pave the whole surface. We have to always keep this particular space to be open for cleaning and maintenance. You cannot line it up like that. So, this is concealed. 
if you notice a section of a uh, particular garden, this is a garden and you have a surface which has been worked out for pavement, you can always have a 150 mm DPC that is provided right at the edge of the house and then provide the gully there. The gully would actually adjust or retain the structure based on the level of water that is coming. So, that is how the drainage is paved all along the surface and you, uh, if you are providing any kind of pavers which are uh, you know of a different material like uh, clay or something, you can always think of a dish channel system which would actually pave the drain all along. The purpose of the drainage system is basically to facilitate any kind of uh, runoff from the roof to the pr to prevent any kind of structural collapse also. And even if any plant has to drown while retaining enough moisture to support all the plant life, we drain off the system and facilitate runoff. The roof drainage should be integrated into the building drainage system. The drainage facilities should be capable of collecting both overflow from the drainage hose as well as surface water from the vegetation support. Of course, while conveying it away from the uh, building. The drainage system should be permanent and should cover the entire roof area. The water reaction retention should be desirable as an environmental mandate. This retention of water might require increased cup size of the drainage which are also called as versicels, a water retention layer and engineered growing medium which would actually integrate into the roof drainage system to within the building drainage. We can also think of providing something like a filter sheet all along your pavements. So, these filter sheets drain all the water and retain the growing media as well as the roots if you are providing any kind of uh, uh, vegetation and landscape all around. So, the growing medium selection is very critical for us because it should be decided based on long term as well as short term successes of a green roof and the following factors can be considered while selecting the growing medium. If the tree or the plant is load bearing, if it has, if the whole surface has any slope, the climatic conditions are bad or worse, what are the drainage aspects and the kind of plant species that you are going to pick up for it. The natural mineral components of any kind of a roof garden or substrate which includes sand, clay, lava, pumice or even gravel and the artificial or modified mineral components such as perlite, vermiculite are used in the roof gardening system. So, when you provide this filter system and also try to think of artificial as well as natural mineral components before providing a roof garden, you should also think about adding up some organic materials like peat and compost to substrate the formulate. When it gets substrated, a lightweight soil amendment can reduce the substrate weight and support any kind of plant growth. So, this is very important for us to understand the pH value because the pH value should be at least 5.5 to 8 and the air content in the water storage capacity should be more than 20 to 40 percent by volume. So, when this is done all along the surface of a water uh, you know a filter sheet and if you are even planting up any kind of vegetation around, it is very easy for us to have an impervious surface. What happens in the drainage in basements or even in the drainage in paved surfaces which could be anything below the ground level. Now, for example, if this is the ground level and you see that there are spaces which are designed below the ground level also called also called as the basements. Now, these basements would also have toilets or even anything that is going to let out water to us. So, there would be plastic pipes and there would be basins there. So, you have to consider providing some kind of a perforated pipe all along some kind of a rock. So, this particular perforation basically would have another perforation hose there and it would also have some kind of a perforation value while it is installed within the ground surface. There are many ways in which water can also enter a basement. 
if in case we have a garage or even if we have a storage space or even if we have any kind of a habitable space, understanding how water enters the basement is very crucial to determine a proper solution. Rain and groundwater are the common causes of basements. So, if you notice if this is a house and this has a basement, the rain water basically comes in and adds up. So, there is a lot of moisture which is going to be put up along the walls. So, this moisture of the air is drawn in through the cracks as well as block cores and all the warm air rises because of the moist air and that warm air is going to make the building weak as well as uh, you know very difficult for people to live there because of the smell that comes out as well as because of the way in which the whole water starts getting logged. Or what you can also do is you can also try to see if there are gutters which are provided if you do not have proper downspouts, provide an extension so the water is not directed into the basement and always make sure gutters are provided. So, if the water uh, comes into the basement it is because you have not designed it well with respect to extensions or even gutters. Basement drains are also provided where water is not drained well. So, carrying it into the whole housing system and causing health concerns for the residents is one of the major fundamental aspect of a uh, basement. So, here in the basement the soil starts becoming saturated be below the footing as well as the sap. So, you have to be very sure in terms of how uh, you are going to sensitize the equipment there. So, the uh, there are not going to be normal uh, materials there. So, drainage of basements or rooms where wall membranes are not used is equally important for us. So, if a basement is provided we have to always think about providing the right kind of damp essential equipments which are not normally present for buildings which are at ground floor level. So, how does water basically enter into the basement? You see water enters through concrete or through any kind of stack effect where moist air moves to the upper level and drives in negative air effect. So, all the moisture enters into the basement by capillary suction and through the concrete. This moist air is drawn in through cracks and block cores and it enters into the building and from there all the warm air starts rising up. This makes the building very difficult to habit uh, to start living it. So, you have to be very sure about how exactly you are downspouting it. So, downspouting and providing the right kind of extenders is how you can actually work on it. Otherwise, slope the ground around the building at least 1 inch away of a foot of a slope is recommended for at least to keep the water 6 feet away from the house. And make sure all the gutters and downspouts are away from your foundation walls. So, the water should not enter into your foundation walls. So, you have to be sure about the angle upon which you are letting out the water from the downspouts. So, when water proofing is covered by any kind of a protection board all right, and there is some kind of rigid insulation which is added outside the water proofing in place of any kind of protection. You can also have an alternative method where a free draining membrane just like a filter is used to drain out all the water in place of free draining backfill. What happens here in this kind of a residence or a house is in, in case of free draining the drain screen would screen all the water screen all the pollutants and let in only the water. Here the ground flow water is starting to get downward. Okay, and not horizontal. So, because of gravity it starts entering into the ground water. So, the here you would always let out another fabric which is a filter fabric above and below the drain pipe. This is a drain pipe here with the coarse gravel. So, when you do this with perforations what happens is the water stops collecting around the house, but rather perforates into the soil and lets itself out into the sewer. Also make sure that you are uh, you know thinking about something which is child safety. So, a child proof cover should also be provided with airtight sumps. So, no other mishaps are seen uh, in along the construction site. Now, for example, if this is your basement 
you have a foundation wall, always think of providing some kind of a protection drain board with alongside your footer and then have the drain pipe. So, all the water gets protected does not fall there, but rather falls on the outside grade has the sedimentation protection cloth here and then there is stone aggregate from where it percolates into the protection sock and enters into the drain pipe. So, this is a more convenient method if you are trying to think about development after laying down your uh, sewers because if this is a boundary and that is your internal space you can always think of having this kind of a you know a protection cloth or a sediment protection cloth all along your boundary till your existing structure. There are various ways in which we can actually pro uh, protect percolation of water into the uh, from the buildings. One is by providing roof garden. So, roof garden will also have layers of uh, you know membranes. One would be a waterproofing membrane, second would be a protection board third would be a drainage sail and a geotex uh, textile fabric. Also with it, it has some kind of a drainage cell which would wash off all the river sand only let the soil mix in through the outlet pipe. So, all the water which is needed for the plants is sucked up by the plants and then the um, water enters into the ground. Once it enters into this coarse sand uh, layer there is river sand here right. So, this river sand mixes with the water and then it gets drained into the cell. Once it gets drained that is the outlet pipe. So, the from the outlet pipe the water starts leaving out to the uh, you know storm water drainage or otherwise if you notice in paving what we see is if this is paved continuously through and through and the water cannot enter into the sand. Uh, so, the, this is the river sand which is basically having a lot of coarse wash. So, so there is also um, a drainage uh, membrane as well as a drainage cell as well as an outlet here. So, you have to be sure about how exactly you are laying out the textile fabric. So, all the water percolates down to the ground and then out into the uh, storm water uh, drainage. You can also provide planter boxes all along your um, you know uh, basements. So, if in case you have constructing your basement over there, you can always think of having this also an, as an alternative option where basically all the plants are put up all along the channelization of your storm water drains. So, these are various methods in which people have actually thought of storm water uh, you know uh, runoffs. If this is a lawn of a particular residence, what they have done is they have actually provided a lot of uh, these uh, bunds where all the water starts getting collected and from there it drains off into the storm water drains. The next Recharge method is the rainwater harvesting. This is a process which involves collection and storage of rainwater with any kind of a design artificially designed system that runs off natural or man made catchment areas. Example could be rooftops, or compounds, the rock surfaces, or even hill slopes or artificially repaired impervious or semi pervious land surfaces. Now, if you actually understand rainwater harvesting, it definitely depends upon various factors which contribute to the amount of rainwater which is harvested. Example, the frequency and the quantity of rainfall, the catchments, the characteristics of water, the demands of water and the quantum of runoff play a very important role in terms of understanding the volumes and economics of artificial uh, water storage. These water storage tanks and also the underground soil strata for the ground water recharge the rainwater. So, how does this work? This basically works in collection of the rainwater and once it overflows all the overflowed water that is such that only the clean water comes out to your collection, only the overflown water comes out and then it is harvested by catching it in the right places and trying to understand the demand of it by building up some kind of a system where you can actually have either rooftop or even surface top 
um, filters. Rainwater harvesting is basically classified into rooftop rainwater harvesting or surface rainwater harvesting. Rooftop rainwater harvesting is a harvest which is basically any water which falls upon the roofs as the name suggests. Whereas, rainwater which has fallen upon any surrounding ground surface is called as surface rainwater harvesting. So, basically what we do here is we collect all the water in rust proof tanks and we try to assemble all the water by having inbuilt debris collection for the debris and then use the same water either for flushing of cisterns, for watering your gardens or even for you know certain types it can even be used for drinking purposes if we filtered it really well. So, applications are it is ideal for domestic as well as agricultural use. Owing to our vast experience we are engaged in the kind of systems that we use nowadays we do not even get sanctioned plans if we do not have rainwater harvesting being thought of right at your uh, you know uh, drawings. So, your drawings or your completion drawings if they do not consist the rainwater details then they are accustomed to for rejection of your plan because it is very important for us to think of uh, you know actually saving whatever comes out as stormwater runoff and collecting it and using it for efficient purposes. Now, this harvesting basically happens like see certain times many people use it for flushing of their cisterns or even to um, water their gardens. Otherwise, you can even use it um, for other uh, grey water purposes where washing of utensils, washing of your clothes and all can be done. So, what happens is you are collecting all the water in this uh, you know container and when needed you pump it, you pump it to the flushing cisterns or you pump it to the car wash connections or at least to your garden um, you know taps from where you can actually reuse the whole water which is collected. The various methods of uh, basically you know harvesting rainwater, one could be through roadside drains. Here rainwater which is falling upon the ground is used to recharge the ground water rather than letting it out into the drainage systems. However, many times this water is actually collected in storage water tanks. The rainwater barrels, this is a very dry system where water is stored in large storages. In comparison to the barrel system, here water can be stored with the help of dry system. After the rainfall, the water pipes and the drainages turn dry. So, this system is also called as dry system. Moreover, these systems are very easy to install and it is effortless to identify leakages in this kind of a system. In the wet system, the water is collected in pipes which are beneath the ground surfaces and this system is called wet because all of the time the water pipes are full with water even after the rainy season. However, water level of the pipes remains constant and this water can be used for longer periods of time. Also, this reduces water leakage into the soil. So, rooftop rainwater harvesting basically collects all the water at the roofs, stores it at an underground storage. There might be a lot of soil particles and all which are filtered and this filtration basically happens by bringing to forward many layers of sands, gravels, uh, beds and all the water is let in and the water which is let out comes and falls into another storage tank from where we use the water for other domestic purposes. Rooftop harvesting is one method which actually uses all the catchment area as the rooftop and includes the rooftops of houses, flats, factories and offices. Whereas, runoff harvesting is collected from open spaces or larger open spaces like gardens, lawns, landscapes and we harvest here. This is advantageous in areas where uh, water uh, fall is scanty and we have to actually collect all the water from the driveways and surface water which is basically falling on all the impervious surfaces. So, when we collect all the runoff water and use it for further you know no, domestic purposes then that is called as runoff harvesting. 
So, what is rooftop rainwater harvesting also called as RRH. So, basically what happens is we collect the rainwater is collected at the roof, sloped roof, so that is why they are called as the collection areas, enters into the gutters from where they all come and store themselves in a recharge facility. Now, this recharge facility there would be two different facilities certain times, one would be for direct when the water is scanty and low and so the water gets collected there, but during the rainy season when water is at an extreme high level. So, you would also have another refill facility which could actually give you water for the rest of the year and that is another facility that you can think of and maybe use it as a well or maybe use it as any other device from where water can be sourced for your further purposes. Harvesting of the rain water from any rooftop is very easy and eco friendly and this augments even at every small house level. So, rooftop rainwater harvesting involves diverting as well as recharging the rainwater that falls on the roof. This recharges the groundwater as a common practice and is implemented in many houses nowadays and even in apartment complexes. This system consists of three basic elements, one is a collection area, second is a conveyance system, third is storage facilities. So, collection area is mostly roof of the house or the building and the effective roof of the, and the material used in constructing the roof actually influence the efficiency and collection of the water quality. Conveyance is basically what exactly happens after you collect all the water. You start using it to deliver all the rain water which falls into your roof to other storage vessels. So, you use gutters or pipes. So, gutters and pipes fall under their conveyance system. Both drain pipes and roof surfaces should be constructed at with respect to you know chemically inert uh, materials such as wood, plastic and aluminum in order to avoid any kind of other effects on water quality from there. And how exactly are we going to store this water for further purposes is our next concern. So, water ultimately is stored in a storage tank or a cistern which is constructed of an inert material. This inert material could be either reinforced concrete, fiberglass or even stainless steel totally depending on what kind of usage you would like to use with respect to your water. These storage tanks may be constructed as part of the building or may be built as a separate unit located at a distance from the building. So, imagine if this is the catchment area from where the water comes the rain water is collected in a storage system then enters into the filtration system from where you would again connect it to a separate sump or a main tank which is made of concrete. This could be you know closer to the uh, soil. So, maybe there could be chances of this water entering into this uh, ground water and the what ground water table could be increasing uh, and from there you would pump it to another tank and th from there you would use it for all your other domestic purposes. So, a narrow filter can be used and you can even use it for drinking because rain water is uh, pure in its form and this water is filtered also. So, when it is filtered and pumped and brought to your drinking levels then until then the whole cycle becomes pure and it is easy for you to even get the right kind of water there. Any rooftop system basically would have a catchment as I mentioned called also called as a rooftop. The conveyances which are basically pipes and also there is something called as a first flush separator. Now, what is a flush separator? This is for the first trains. Right after the first trains when it is collected in the first storage tank you flush this water and you separate this water during because this would consist of all the dirt and pollutant which would be there at the roof of the building or your roofs and it would come towards your storage tanks. So, if you flush this off right there by separating it before it enters into the filtration it is always convenient to use the next water which comes and falls upon your roofs. The next component is a filtration. The next component is storage and how we use it and recharge the whole system. 
So, these are certain components of a rooftop system which are basically used in any kind of rainwater as well as runoff water harvesting. Along with it, we also have certain other basic terms which fall you know in alignment with uh, harvesting one is catchment. The catchment is basically any uh, harvesting system which is basically catching up all the rain for it. So, it could be a terrace, terrace could be flat RCC roof or even a sloping roof. So, the catchment of the area is actually contributing to the kind of rain water that is entering into your system. Conveyance or pipelines. So, these pipelines could be carried down to the water pipes or drains until the harvesting system. They should be UV resistant because uh, uh, this is needed for the required capacity of the water that comes in and water from all the sloping roofs should be you know um, caught at the gutters and they should be taken down until the pipe to the mouth of the each of the drain with a wire mesh to restrict any kind of floating material which would have come through the rains. As I mentioned earlier, first flush is a device which would flush off the water which is received in the first showers. The first shower of the re needs, uh, rain needs to be flushed out so that it does not contaminate your uh, storage tank. The contamination of the storage tank is protected by having this kind of a flush tank and this would have all the contaminants of the atmosphere, of the catchment roof, etcetera, etcetera. And thus, it also helps in cleansing of silt which would be there in all these storage tanks and other materials which would be deposited on the roof during the non-rainy season. Provisions of this rain separator should be made at every outlet of each of the drain pipes. So, this is a first flush separator. So, you would have a first gutter and then that would be connected to your storage. So, right there you would separate it and then you would connect that thing to another storage reservoir. So, when that happens this gets closed and the storage connects itself to another storage reservoir. Filter. Filters are basically used for treatment of the water to effectively remove turbidity, color as well as any kind of microorganisms. After the first flushing of rainfall, water basically passes through filters directly stored in the tank and these filters before the usage. These filters would have gravel, sand as well as a netlon mesh and a pressure filter is designed and placed on top of the storage tank or near the tank depending on the usage. What is a pressure sand filter? Now, a pressure sand filter basically consists of a pressure vessel. This could be either vertical or horizontal which is filtered with a set of frontal pipe works. These pipe works would also have walls, it would have graded silica which is sand and also supported by layers of grades under bed consisting of pebbles and gravels. When this is done, all the incoming water cuts through the section of the filter and under the drain it collects only the filtered water and this is done through a lot of pressure. So, this pressure is brought up by the pebbles and gravels which are existent in the filter. So, the raw water which flows downwards through this filter bed as a suspended matter, matter has been treated by addition of coagulant like alum. So, you can add a little of alum to retain the sand surface between the sand grains immediately below the surface. When there is a sudden rise in the loss of head as the filter process continues, the flow reduces and once the pressure drops, the filter becomes excessively underutilized. So, this is how it works. So, you would have your rainwater which comes in, you have various layers, one is sand, aggregate and pebbles. Along with it you also have this pressure which is basically built so that only filtered rain water comes out. <coughs> now, what is unfiltered rain water? Now, all the unfiltered rain water basically enters into another storage system which would have a black flush waste to waste. Okay? So, this is a filtered bed which would have coal on the first layer, 
sand on the second layer, fine gravel and large gravel at the final layers. So, when all the unfiltered water enters into the system, this, this system of filters would at least be from 0.7 to 3 meters, they would con filter itself and by the time it enters into the whole system of valves or pipes, the water would have filtered itself. So, once the filtered water is uh, treated, it enters into the storage cabins. Now, these storage cabins are places where water is collected from all the roofs and stored for further usage. This could be depend, this could, uh, the scale could uh, vary depending on the sizes and the usage. Some people use larger storage tanks, some use only plastic buckets and jerry cans. Others actually design a clay or a cement jar or a ceramic jar and certain people also use drums. For larger quantities of water, this system also requires a larger tank with a cylinder or a um, ferro cement uh, ring which is placed as uh, on top so that we can open it and clean it and maintain it. The storage tank is provided with a cover, so any kind of contamination is removed from external sources and this tank is provided with pipe fixtures. These pipe fixtures are placed at appropriate places to draw the water and to dispose of any kind of extra water. The storage tanks could be found in different shapes and different positions depending on the conditions upon which you would want to use this particular water. A rainwater tank designs include a minimum requirement. One is you should have a solid secure cover. Now, this without a cover is of no use to us because all the water gets uh, you know uh, added on to the other particles which are existent in the atmosphere and might even get um, you know even though this is treated water might even get polluted. So, we have to be very careful about you know usage of this water. So, you have to first have a you know, cover. Next, you should have an inlet filter, should have an overflow pipe. So, we know as to that the water is full now and uh, the tank is full, a manhole and a sump to facilitate cleaning and an extraction system to see if there is no contamination of water. In case there is contamination, then we can remove the water by a tap or a pump or something. So, any kind of an extraction system can be used. A soakway to prevent any kind of spilled water from forming puddles near the tank. So, a soakway or a minus uh, you know drain can be provided there. Additional features could be a device to indicate how much of water is prevalent in the tank, a sediment tramp also inclusive of a tip bucket or other foul flush mechanisms, a lock on the tap and a second subsurface tank to provide water for livestock. In case you have livestock, in case you would like to use the same water for drinking purposes of your animals and all, you can use another subsurface tank. So, this is how it looks. You have your roof, the gutter collects all the water and downspouts it. So, you would have a uh, separate storage for the first uh, flush system. First rains are flushed out, there is a cover, then it enters into the storage system. You would also have a tap, a concrete or a tinder block system is basically put up there and you would have a separate storage tank in case of livelihood, um, cattle and his livestock. This is a cistern which is basically provided for uh, runoff uh, harvesting. So, you have laminated roofs or any kind of asbestos roofs which would actually collect all the water from the collector devices and lead you into the cleaning and maintenance door. And once it comes into the floor level and enters into your storage, you will have a suction pipe all through your filters. So, when that is done, it is excavated and all the cisterns are basically uh, collecting all the water for your next toilet visit. There are various other places in which we can actually see how this water can be served. So, this is a tank reservoir with an inverted roof. This is basically con uh, conducive 
for a water tank which is going to have an overflow. So, the water tank after an overflow actually enters into the reservoir there, this water space you see the water body there and this is a reservoir. So, this inverted roof is also a place where uh, we can actually start harvesting all the water. What are the ways in which we drain out the water? Now, water can be drained through pumps, motorized pumps or even taps. Depending on the position and the usage of the water, we can basically try to see as to how we are going to drain out all the water from the systems for further usage. Rainwater use could be in terms of four uh, different categories. One is intermittent. This is basically where you have one long rainy season when all the water demands are met by the rainwater. During the dry season, the water is collected from other sources. So, it is intermittent. It is basically working only during the period of need. Occasional here, the water is stored only for a few days in a small container. This is suitable when there is a uniform pattern of rainfall throughout without the rain and when a rain, reliable alternative water source is available for us. So, if you have a water source also alongside the rainwater harvesting, so you use an occasional rainwater harvester. A partial one, here the rainwater is used throughout the year, but the harvest is not sufficient for all your demands. So, the rainwater is used only for drinking and cooking while for other domestic purposes, you might use the other sources of water. Full, this rainwater is used throughout the year for all your domestic purposes come because all of it is dependent on your rainwater. In such cases, there is no alternative water source for you other than rainwater and the available water should be well managed with enough storage to bridge the dry period. So, basically what happens is you can, so now all your water is collected, it comes into your storage okay, and all your storage would be filled. So, you have, you have a lot of caves, uh, storage reservoirs. So, all of them would be filled which are laid at least 2 feet below your ground level. So, excess water would outflow and the, um, these would actually have some kind of water leakages. So, in case this water gets leaked into the, this rainwater enters into the aquifer of the undergrounds. So, what happens is you would also have a uh, pump. So, all your clean ground water would be here, you would have a water pump which would actually uh, be like a bore well or something and this would pump out all the water into the overhead tank and you would use this water for your purposes. There is another uh, uh, underground sump that you would be constructing which is basically for the raw water storage and this water could be used either for vehicle washing or even for uh, rain water uh, for plants and gardens. Design of a storage of uh, any rainwater tank is basically dependent on the kind of rainfall that your particular household gets or your site gets. The size of the catchment and the drinking water requirements of your particular area. The next part of drainage is basically landscape drainage. Now, if you notice this is an image of a landscape where you have your hardscape and your softscape. This is a hardscape area in the softscape. So, once you water all your plants, this would take in all the water and let it into the underground uh, uh, ground water table. But whatever you are watering upon your hard surface basically is impervious. So, as you know that water is quite essential for us in terms of how it flows. When any residential property experiences drainage issues, which is a nuisance, you have to always think about what kind of damages are we providing at our exterior spaces. So, there could be a lot of drainage problems including puddling, pooling, saturated soil and even undirected downspout. So, which could destroy our landscape and also turn your backyard into a swamp. So, you have to be very sure about providing the right kind of uh, uh, sewage uh, outlets. So, all the moisture and mold problems which would have damaged your houses or your foundations, which is a major serious concern, 
would can be improved by installing one proper drainage system. So, you have to deal with this problem right at the introduction of your uh, drainage system because considering the fact that your landscape would have grassy swale and also bog areas in your landscape, you would have your French drain or even a dry well system or corrugated plastic tube. So, these are the different ways in which landscapes can be drained. Grassy swale is where a swale is an area which is carefully graded to direct the water. So, you would have a grade system there. So, it helps this swale basically helps the water to dissipate over a larger area or directs all the water to a bog planting or a drain. So, there would be a drain here. This is basically as width as wide as the bottom width. So, as in how you get rain water, the slope will start flattering all the water there and it would fabricate it into the surface of the ground. Next bog area in the landscapes, the landscaping areas can be of great drainage solution with areas of small amount of excess water. There are certain plants or landscape, uh, you know, softscapes like red twig, dogwoods, willows, and many native plants in each region, which could be adapted to periodic bog conditions. Now, these bog conditions or bog gardens exist in the nature in low lying areas and around pools, lakes, or streams. Bog garden plants love moist soil, which is waterlogged but not standing. So, you can have a kind of a bog garden around such kind of areas and this would also make a lovely attraction in any landscape and can quickly turn an unused waterlogged spot into a yard which is uh, wonderful aesthetically. French drain. Now, what is a French drain? It is the most well known type of an outdoor drainage system. While the specifics of each of the drainage vary, a French drain is usually having a perforated pipe which is surrounded by gravel. So, you would have a pipe which is surrounded by gravel, then it is wrapped in a filter fabric to keep all the mud and particles out. A French drain basically dry, directs all the water to a drain rather than dispersing it within the landscape. So, all of it directly enters into the main drainage from the French drain. So, this is a perforated drain, you would have gravel all along it and there is soil all along. So, there is a fabric of filter there. So, this would perforate all the storm water and actually let out only that uh, the water that is unused or untreated into the storm water. So, you can even have coal to uh, be one of the filter layer. So, you will have your washed drainage gravel there and a fabric which is also connected and wrapped around your pipe. There is another system called as a dry well system. This is an environmentally friendly alternative to a French drain because here all the water is discharged from the storm water into the site. These downspouts or drains are directed to an underground storage well. The water slowly starts filtering out into the well and eventually ends up back into the ground water table thus increasing your ground water table intensity. These dry wells would have a layer of uh, tube which is basically going to store all your water and then there would be perforations all along the casing. These perforations are through which all the water gets filtrated into the ground water. And uh, then the since the ground water starts uh, you know rising, then you can pump it in through your bore wells or even through your um, wells, open wells and then have some kind of storm water runoffs which are going to be collected at the upper layers and further usage in your domestic purposes. The last type of drain is basically the corrugated plastic tubes. This is a very inexpensive method where you are directing the water through downspouts. It is simply corrugated tubes made out of plastic which is sitting above your downspouts and they can be buried underground directly and for the water to disperse onto the drain. Now, the last part of uh, storm water management is how do we reduce the load on the municipal system. When we know that there is so much of water which is retented, which is infiltrated, which is pervious and impervious, which is uh, 
connected and uh, recharged and reharvested and all of that. Now, we also know that all these waters one or the other time entered into our municipal system. So, how do we reduce this particular load? If you actually understand the whole cycle of wastewater in an urban environment, you see there is residential wastewater which is basically black water and grey water, black water coming out of toilets and grey water which comes out of bathing and kitchen spaces, which is called as domestic wastewater. Along with it the commercial and institutional wastewater also come and join there and there would be industrial wastewater which is non treated and treated. All of them together come and merge at the municipal sewage. This municipal sewage would either have a separate sewage system or a combined sewage system from where all the urban runoff is also inclusive when it enters into your storm water drainage. So, this is the whole cycle of the flow of wastewater in any en urban environment. Now, all the collected wastewater which contains pollutants which could be originating from any kind of household, the business and commercial establishments as well as industrious industries would have some kind of municipal wastewater which is having general composition of the uh, biochemical oxygen demand, which would include some 5 categories of municipal wastewater. One is the organic matter which is also known as BOD, disease causing microorganism, nutrients which could be nitrogen and phosphorus, toxic contaminants as well as dissolved minerals. So, all of these together are there prevalent in our storm water. So, there are various ways in which we treat the water. I have already shown you the various methods in which water is treated. The municipal wastewater actually enters into a waste treatment plant, then effluents are discharged into the surface uh, waters. Otherwise, effluents go to the treatment plant for the other reuses and then it is treated and let out into your you know agricultural lands for so that you can apply it to your crops or the sludge treatments are again let out into your um, lands agricultural spaces so all the reuse opportunities are seen as we already saw in the previous classes but then those are again categorized as preliminary primary and secondary kind of treatments of municipal wastewater now here you do not see this particular part, but the additional treatment is also needed in terms of conventional wastewater treatment before reuse. Here all the sludge from the wastewater treatment processes are treated and then disposed or reused in the crop production or other applications. Now, this wastewater is conventionally subjected to a lot of treatments and they are justified by local conditions. Preliminary treatment would affect any kind of minimal changes in the wastewater quality. Primary treatment would remove one third of the BOD and one half of the suspended solids in domestic wastewaters. Whereas, combined primary and secondary treatment is required to at least achieve 85 percent reduction in both BOD as well as suspended soil concentration to meet the regulatory definition of secondary treatment. So, with all of these things put together we at least achieve 85 to 90 percent of tre treated water at the end stage. Once it enters into this stage, the preliminary state as I mentioned is all about screening and grit removal where you will get a lot of residue. This would have sedimentation residue, this would have sludge residue and this would have nutrient as well as solid removal through tertiary treatment. So, all these treatments are basically removing everything from us which is heavy, inorganic as well as solid and it might interfere with our treatment processes. So, the primary treatment basically removes all or screens all the grits. The secondary basically removes all the biological, it is basically the biological treatment plant. So, it basically removes all the microorganisms in suspension and uh, all the microorganisms which are biologically flocculated to form any kind of cell tellable particles follow this kind of a treatment and they would have some kind of separate tanks as shown in the previous class of, of suspension called a secondary sludge also known as biological sludge or a trickling filter hummus. So, here all the hummus or the waste or the you know dead waste are actually filtered and then the other end products 
which are actually producing all the carbon dioxide and other in the products are uh, kept together as energy to support a microorganism community. The last part is where we are treating the water in a tertiary or an advanced voice water treatment. So, this is when the receiving water conditions uses high quality effluent other than that a uh, waste water treatment. This disinfection actually removes all the pathogenic microorganisms from the tertiary treatment and this is where we basically add chlorine and anything with the aid of a coagulant to actually activate and remove all the persistent organic compounds and trace elements. This also reduces nitrification and this basically is to minimize the nutrient enrichment of the surface water. So, nitrogen is also removed and phosphorus is also removed. Nitrogen is removed by nutrification followed by denitrification and phosphorus is removed by microbial uptake or chemical precipitation. When all of these things happen together, all the waste water gets uh, treated before it enters into the municipal sewage and that is when the water gets treated and it enters into our uh, sources. So, this is the whole process of the water right from its source. Uh, you know, if we actually get back to the previous classes and see we saw water entering into our homes from the sources and then the water being used for various purposes and from there the water starts getting treated in terms of either you know the various types of systems that are going to convey it and collect it and then advance it with respect to the various assessment techniques that we uh, were involved. As the assessment techniques were involved, we see that the water gets treated. There was a courtesy video from YouTube in the previous class which you can also go back to. So, see this whole treatment process in detail. And after that you also see that there are various treatment plants which come in along with the storage of uh, the water which comes out as runoff either from the um, roofs or as the uh, you know surface. So, these waters are again getting inside our treatment plants and then they are getting treated before they enter into our uh, lakes and reservoirs. With this we end the session uh, and also conclude module 2 with this class. Thank you so much. Thank you for patiently listening to us.